The video game industry is now over 40 years old, having begun in late 1972 with Atari's release of Pong. During its first decade, the industry faced a series of significant questions about the scope of copyright protection available for games. The industry's first lawsuit, filed in October 1973, raised the question of whether the lines on a printed circuit board are eligible for copyright protection. Towards the end of the 1970s, a case involving a computerized chess game raised the question of whether computer programs embodied on ROM as object code are eligible for copyright protection. And early in the 1980s, a case involving Scramble raised the question of whether the audiovisual displays of video games are eligible for copyright protection. In each of these three cases, one of the lead attorneys was George Gerstmann. Mr. Gerstmann practiced intellectual property law in Chicago for over 50 years and has recently published a professional biography of his career entitled Clear and Convincing Evidence. Mr. Gerstmann will be my guest today to discuss these cases and more on this episode of Games Are Not Coffee Mugs. My guest today is George Gersman. For nearly five decades, he practiced intellectual property law here in Chicago with a diverse range of clients and a diverse range of intellectual property issues. As some patent examples, in 1964, he filed the patent for the bow tie television antenna. Years later, he represented the inventor of the push button release socket wrench. And along the way, he even filed the patent for a tie clip with a pull down shade to protect the tie against spills. He was also an expert witness in many patent cases, such as immersion suit against Sony involving the vibration features of the controller. As some trademark law examples, he represented Ernie Terrell, the world heavyweight champion of boxing, in a lawsuit against Muhammad Ali. He represented Playboy against a lounge called The Bunny Club. As for copyright, he handled several important cases for the video game industry during its first decade. The book is called Clear and Convincing Evidence. So let me start with the question of the title choice. What do you mean by clear and convincing evidence? Well, that's really the burden of proof that's used in a lot of facets of a patent case. For example, although a patent is uh, presumed valid, in order to prove that it's invalid, you really have to show invalidity by clear and convincing evidence. Also, uh, for showing willful infringement, that has to be proven by clear and convincing evidence. And if you want to show that a patent is unenforceable due to uh, inequitable conduct on the patent office, that has to be proven by clear and convincing evidence. And I like the title, and I used it. OK. Well, before turning to the, the video game cases, let's talk a little bit about your background. So where did you go to school, and what did you study in college? Well, I graduated from the University of Illinois in Champaign with an electrical engineering degree. OK. Uh, and then after you graduated college, you did not go straight to law school. You instead went to the patent office. Well, sort of. I, I did, in a way, go to law school right then because I, the law school started in September of that year. Uh, I graduated. However, uh, right after I graduated, I went to um, the patent office as a patent examiner. Now, while I was a patent examiner, I went to law school in the evening. Okay. So it started a couple of months after. Law school started a couple of months after the patent office? After okay. the patent office started, right. And what was work like at the patent office in the 1960s? Oh. There were a lot of patent examiners at that time also going to evening law school. It was in Washington, D.C., and uh, there were a lot of good law schools there. Uh, as a patent examiner, uh, first we had a two-week training course. And after the two-week training course, it was pure patent examination where I would receive applications that were submitted by inventors and the companies and I would review them for patentability. And every examiner had his or her own art. My art was inductor devices and also voltage uh, regulation systems. So if something came in with that background or with, that, with claims toward those inventions, I would examine them and look for patentability. And some would be rejected, and we'd go back and forth until a patent was issued. Now, at the time you were in law school, intellectual property wasn't necessarily going to be a part of a curriculum at a particular law school. But at George Washington, it was a part of the curriculum, right? Right. In fact, I picked George Washington Law School uh, 
primarily for that, not only did they have an evening program, but they had a great program for uh, everyone who wanted to go into uh, patent law. It was called patent law at that time. But they had courses on patents, courses on trademarks, copyrights, unfair competition. In fact, they were so patent-oriented that my moot court competition that I had was a patent infringement case. Were these classes popular with the students at the time? They certainly were popular with the patent examiners mm -hmm. and anyone who wanted to go into... Uh, it, now, it wouldn't call intellectual property law at that time, mm -hmm. but anyone who wanted to go into that field would take these courses, and they were excellent. Okay. Uh, and so you graduated in 1963. Yes. And then what did you do right after graduation? I went to a law firm in Chicago. It was called the Dressler Firm, and uh, then took the bar exam and became a lawyer. Now, at the time you went into practice, large firms often didn't have intellectual property departments. From what you've said in the book, intellectual property was often practiced by smaller boutique firms, and the large firms weren't doing that sort of work. That's correct. Um, they're really, in fact, the only large firm I can even think of that had a real, what I call a patent department, because they weren't calling it intellectual property departments at that time. Um, was Kirkland and Ellis. Mm -hmm. Usually it was, these were boutiques, they were small firms, uh, just as mine was, and uh, uh, everyone in the firm was a patent, trademark, or copyright lawyer, or usually uh, we were called patent lawyers, and we really had to know patent law, trademark law, copyright law, unfair competition law, trade secret law. Uh, you were, in a way, a jack of all trades. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, uh, and, and it wasn't really until not maybe 20 years ago that the large firms began having uh, very large intellectual property departments. You mentioned interviewing at one firm where the patent attorneys were in what must have been the worst offices. Okay, that was interesting. Uh, it was a firm called, called Pope Ballard, and I had a friend who was a patent attorney who was working there. And while I was at the Dressler firm, after about five years of being at the Dressler firm, he said, why don't you check out my firm? It's a good firm. And I said, this will be interesting, because it was a general firm. And that was very unusual, with a, as I was saying, with a general firm having any patent lawyers. So I went there, and I interviewed with, actually the senior partner showed me around, and the, the offices were beautiful. They were wood-paneled offices. Uh, there was oriental carpeting, mahogany desks. I was really impressed, and he showed me the partners and associates, these beautiful... He, then he said, now let me show you the patent lawyers. And he brought me into a room with a linoleum floor and a few metal desks, and they were all sitting there. I said to myself, God, they're really treating us as second-class citizens. <laughs> so even though I was offered a job there, I stayed away. Uh, now, how would you describe the mix of your work... Um... At the beginning and over time, was it mostly patent work, and did that hold true over the years? It was mostly patent work. I'd say, um, except maybe in the early 80s, uh, it was at least 50% patents, at least 25% trademarks, and then some copyright scattered. And even the last oh, 20 years, I did a lot of patent expert witnessing. But I would say that... Uh, most of my practice was in the patent field. Well, so let's turn to the line of video game cases that you were involved in. So it's a few years later. It's November 1972, and there's a new hot game on the market. It's Atari's Pong. Sure. And other companies that are in the arcade game business, making pinball machines or electromechanical games, copy Pong and start releasing their own versions of Pong. Yep. Now, after a few months, the... Uh, market for the two-player game starts to slow down, and Allied Leisure comes up with a four-player version of Pong, which they sell under the names Tennis Tourney and Ricochet. And then a few months later, in October 1973, Midway releases their own four-player Pong called Winner 4, one based on the circuitry or the printed circuit board used by Allied Leisure 
in their four-player Pong games. That's now, good. the circuit board was designed by a company called Universal Research Laboratories right. here in Illinois. Yes. So could you tell us how you became involved with Universal Research Laboratories? Be glad to. Um, uh, a good friend of mine who passed away recently, he was a terrific patent lawyer, wonderful person, uh, Sid Katz, was uh, a, a, either a partner or an associate at the Fitch firm in Chicago. And they represented at that time URL, Universal Research. However, um, URL, they also represented um, another company that had a conflict with URL at, with respect to certain things. Um, it was, I'm trying to think of the name, and offhand I'm having trouble. Ampex, it was Ampex Corporation. They were based in California, correct? Yes, that's right. And uh, they, uh, Sid asked me to do some work for URL because of this conflict. And I began doing the work for URL. Uh, it ended up that the Fitch firm could no longer handle the URL work because of the Ampex conflict. So I began to do a lot of work for URL. Uh, one day, one of the principals came to me with a circuit board this is from URL, and said, we've developed this circuit board, which is a ver we think is very important. It took us a tremendous amount of time, and we'd like to protect it somehow. We don't know how to protect it. And at that time, you, you really couldn't think of a way to protect a circuit board. It was a physical item. So I said, well, at least put a copyright notice on it, and then we'll register it, and let's see what happens. So we put a copyright notice on it, we got a copyright registration for the drawing that makes up the circuit board. URL owned this. They were the, uh, they had developed it. They had originated it. And uh, about a year later, maybe less, uh, the same principal from URL came to me and said, um, Midway Manufacturing, which is a subsidiary of Bally, is, is using the same circuit board. Can we do something? I said, well, sure. Now, apparently, uh, URL assigned the copyright to Allied Leisure. And URL was really my primary client, but since Allied Leisure now owned it, or had, at least had some exclusive right, we filed a case in the name of Allied Leisure against Midway, and I went in for a temporary restraining order. Now, uh, uh, Allied Leisure was based in Florida, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, so you filed this suit in the Northern District of Illinois. Right. It was October 18th, 1973. Right. This was, as best I can tell, the first lawsuit filed in the video game industry ever. Right. Uh, so you went in uh, on October 19th? I don't remember, uh, <laughs> I don't remember the date. And, uh, either the 18th or the 19th. This is 40 years ago. <laughs> um, you went in on the 18th or the 19th and asked for the temporary restraining order. Right. You had Judge Bauer. Yes. Judge William Bauer, who's now in the Court of Appeals. Right, and he was the district court judge who looked at it. Um, I recall we had a fairly long argument, and he, at a later time, he didn't decide it immediately, but I, I think the, either the next day or later in the day, he decided not to issue the temporary restraining order and set it for a preliminary injunction hearing. And... Uh, we wanted to get started and move along and see what we could do. And I know there was some discovery taken. Uh, I also uh, wanted to look at the, uh, the issue as one, as a copyright on a work of art. In other words, it, it was a little tricky because Bally was taking the position that they never copied the circuit board. I'm sorry, that they never copied the drawing that was filed for the copyright. The technical drawing. The technical drawing. Instead, they said they, they copied, if anything was, anything was copied, it would have been the board itself, not the technical drawing. So there was an issue there as to whether uh, copying the board instead of the technical drawing that was the subject of the copyright could be a copyright infringement. But I felt that we still could consider it a work of art. And I remember going to the Art Institute and talking to one of the curators and asking whether it could be a work of art. And anyway, the case never really was uh, decided because it was settled. And I recall uh, Bally or Midway took a license from my client. You also had an unfair competition claim in the case as well, right. not just a copyright infringement right. uh, claim. Okay. Uh, now, on the other side of the case, 
were Sidney Katz and Don Welsh. You mentioned yeah. Sid Katz a moment ago. Right. Both of them were prominent attorneys in the video game industry going forward from that case. True. Can you say a little bit about their activities in the video game industry? Yes, well, that was probably their first connection to the video game industry. It's funny how that worked out. Uh, Sid actually, in a way, sent me URL as a client, and they obtained Bally as a client because of this case. As I understand it, Bally had another patent attorney or other attorneys that they were using. But because I filed this motion for a temporary restraining order and it was so urgent, I think I filed it in the morning and the, uh, it was set up for that, for that afternoon. Well, Bally's other attorneys weren't available and they called the Fitch mm -hmm. firm and Sid and Don Welsh went over there and handled the case well. And I think Bally liked them like the way they handled it, and that became one of their major clients. It worked out very well for Sid as well as for me. Mm -hmm. Even though the Allied Leisure case never resulted in a decision um, other than a denial of the temporary restraining order and the preliminary injunction, do you know if it had any impact on the industry in terms of changing the prevailing practice, which at first involved fairly widespread copying of games? Mm -hmm. do, do you know if this case affected how the industry approached the question of whether they could or should be copying each other's games in the way that it was happening with Pong? Yeah. Well, I heard that it did. Because uh, I think, you know, even if, let, let's assume a, a printed circuit board isn't copyrightable, well then it could be unfair competition or misappropriation to mm -hmm. copy a circuit board. So I think it really got the industry to realize that uh, knocking off a printed circuit board or any medium in which it contained uh, software or something like that could be a problem. I think it did change things. Okay. Uh, the Allied Leisure case settled on April 12th, 1974. Mm -hmm. The same day, Midway filed a complaint in the Southern District of New York asking for a declaratory judgment that Midway was not infringing the patents uh, owned and licensed uh, from Sanders to Magnavox. Mm -hmm. And this was the litigation that eventually revolved around the so-called Pong patent, the 507 patent issued mm -hmm. to William Rush. And that litigation went on with various parties or various defendants uh, for decades into the 90s. Right. Uh, what was your role in the 507 litigation? Well, one of the companies that they sued early on was Allied Leisure. And again, I got into it because of Universal Research. Also, Universal Research was a, a company that was making the circuit boards and the, uh, the also selling devices that were considered to be by Magnavox and Sanders to be infringing. So they would sell, they sold to companies such as Sears and Montgomery Wards and um, the, so a case was brought by Magnavox and by uh, uh, Sanders against those Sears, Montgomery Wards, Allied Leisure, and probably 15, 20 others. And a lot of them were customers of URL. So there was an indemnity agreement. And I ended up representing a tremendous number of them. I also became local counsel for some uh, from another attorney in New York who had clients who were being sued by a Magnavox, and the suits were taking place in the Northern District of Illinois. So I remember one thing that I did, this is in my book, and, and if, it's real, this is a long time ago. It's hard to remember every detail. That's why I'm glad it's in my book, because it helps uh, re refresh things. Um, the, <laughs> I filed motions to dismiss for lack of proper venue with respect to several of the defendants. And I know several of the defendants were dismissed because they really had not insufficient contact with Illinois. Um, I never handled any trial. I, did a, I handled a lot of settlements. We never went to trial with any of my clients. Uh, one thing I remember doing was uh, during discovery, uh, we really were trying to show that this was not new, that they did not have a valid patent. And as I said, it has to be shown by clear and convincing evidence. Uh, 
uh, one of the things we tried to do was find prior art with respect to those types of video or any type of uh, video game. And I personally went to the patent office in Washington, D.C. And, uh, and studied and looked for prior art. At that time, I'm sorry, the, the patent office was in Arlington, Virginia at that time. And uh, I looked for pa uh, prior art. I think I spent a couple of days and uh, brought back whatever I could find, and we used it as we could. But basically, the cases were settled, at least the ones that I handled for my clients were all settled. You mentioned uh, the litigation in the Northern District of Illinois. Now, Midway mm -hmm. filed in the Southern District of New York the day Allied Leisure settled. Later in that week, uh, Magnavox filed in the Northern District of Illinois against various defendants, including Allied Leisure. Mm -hmm. uh, I assume there was a bit of strategy going on in terms of where parties wanted to be in terms of the circuits. My mm -hmm. hunch would be Midway wanted to be in the Second Circuit because it was perceived as more hostile to patent owners, right. and Magnavox and Sanders Associates wanted to be in the Seventh Circuit because it was seen as more favorably disposed towards patent owners. Well, I didn't even know about that case filed by Midway, but that's correct. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, back then, before the Federal Circuit, and when I say before the Federal Circuit, um, the Federal Circuit really was not even in existence till 1982. So prior to that, patent cases were all appealed to the regional circuits, and there were issues with respect to the differences in the regional circuits of how they handled uh, or how they, uh, the validity issue with respect to uh, uh, whether a patent was valid or invalid. For example, in the Ninth Circuit, hardly any patents were ever held valid. Everything was being held invalid. The Second Circuit was tough on patents. Um, there, uh, people knew this. The patent attorneys knew this. And really, if you were a patent owner, you would try to get into a favorable circuit. Now, the Seventh Circuit was mo not the most favorable, but more favorable than most mm -hmm. with respect to uh, patents. And I'm sure that's why Magnavox, who is represented by Ted Anderson, an excellent mm -hmm. patent attorney, mm -hmm. uh, filed in the Northern District of Illinois. And they did well. Uh, they did oh, well yes. in the case that went to trial. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, based on the various reports I've seen, Magnavox uh, was able to uh, make a good amount of money either through licenses um, without litigation or through settlements and licenses that came after litigation. Yep, and as I recall, the, the, um, the gist, I guess you could say the basic issue and what they considered to be the infringement was if there was a moving object that hit another object and then a distinct motion was mm -hmm. created by that coincidence. Mm -hmm. and, and one of those that two objects it. is controlled by the game and one by the player. Right, right. that's right. it. And that, that so it was a very a... broad uh, <laughs> gameplay patent, so yeah. it obviously implicated a large number of games yeah. and was a, a good source of revenue for the patent owner and for Magnavox. Right, because at that time, most, most games really are games that... Uh, work with coincidence. Something is hit and it moves a different mm -hmm. direction or at a different speed, and that's what Magnavox considered to be an infringement. All right, well, let's move on to uh, another one of your interesting cases. So okay. later in the 70s, uh, the data cache case came yeah. up. Now, that involved what sort of game? A chess computer. Okay. And how did that one end up in litigation? Well, uh, um, my client, JSNA, whom I'd done a lot of work for, and uh, they... In fact, JSNA was one of the early companies in electronic gadgets. Like Brookstone is big now, and uh, uh, there are various other uh, gadget companies and, uh, with electronics, but JSNA was one of the earlier ones in the 70s. They really started, and they had full-page ads, and people knew JSNA. Well, one of the things that they bought from a, a Hong Kong supplier named Novag was uh, this chess computer. And this Novag chess computer apparently was, well, I'll say was derived from Data Cash's chess computer. Uh, it was stipulated that the ROM that bore the, so that bore the uh, computer program uh, was a copy of Data Cash's ROM. So Data Cash brought suit against JSNA. And at that time, JSNA had no idea that Novag had copied 
the ROM, but it came out that they did. So the issue was, how do I get JSNA out of this? And uh, I looked very carefully at all of the uh, materials that came with the data cache chess computer. It was called CompuChess. And I looked at all their materials, and I noticed there was no copyright notice at all. Well, interestingly, now you don't, it's not fatal not to have a copyright notice. You don't have to have a copyright notice. But in prior to 1978, anything that was published prior to 1978 had to have a copyright notice. They changed the Copyright Act of 1976, changed the law so that as of 1978, you no longer had to. But if you did not have the copyright notice on things that were published prior to 1978, that would be fatal to your copyright. So I took the position that there was no notice. They should not. There was no it. copyright notice on the box, no copyright no. notice on the instructions. Printing out the code didn't reveal any kind of embedded notice either. Not even, nor was there one on the ROM. There was just no notice anywhere. And we, we, I studied it very, uh, as much as possible. Um, so uh, data cache, this was before Judge Flom. Who right, in the Northern now, District of Illinois. Right, he was a district court judge then. Now he's on the Court of Appeals. Uh, and uh, the issue was, uh, oh, they, they asked for a preliminary injunction. They moved for a preliminary injunction. Well, I moved for summary judgment at the same time on the ground that it, they lost their copyright. So it was taken under advisement. And I guess both sides were a little surprised by Judge Flom's decision. Although when you look back at it, it was a very interesting decision. Uh, he held, he granted my summary judgment for me, so I won. But it was on a completely different ground. It was on the ground that um, software embodied in a ROM is not copyrightable. And you hadn't even argued that. Hadn't even argued right. that. No one argued yeah. that. And, but he based that on uh, the, uh, Smith, I think it's the White Smith versus Apollo, versus Apollo Supreme Court case way back in around 1908, where uh, piano rolls were not, if, if you copy a piano roll, it's not a copyright infringement of the music. And the idea that uh, something on a material object that can't be read by a human cannot be a copy. So he based it on that and said that there's no copyright infringement. because not, So granted me summary judgment because it's not a copy, and we won. So um, Data Cash appealed to the Seventh Circuit. And Data Cash's whole appeal was that it is copyrightable and, so, and that they should win because it's copyrightable. I recall um, Intel filed a I think filed an amicus brief. Well, the computer industry was very interested in this case. Oh, Once much. Judge Flom resolved this case on the it, grounds that he did. Extremely interested because, I mean, this, in a way, this is sort of devastating to the computer industry because they're being told that software, in effect, isn't copyrightable because it's, it's on some kind of a medium. I mean, I, it, it was left that the only way software would be copyrightable is if someone would see maybe the source code lying on a a piece of paper and someone would copy that piece of paper and that's not exactly what they wanted. Uh, so uh, the industry was very upset and uh, uh, Data Cash appealed on that ground and Intel joined. And I, after I got the briefs, I looked at them and I said, you know, I agree with them fully. I think it's copyrightable. I want to just push the thought that they forfeited the copyright. So. I filed a brief saying I agree with everything they've said in, my, in their briefs, but they don't, they don't have the copyright because they forfeit it by not having the notice. And my issue, my, that became my issue, and of course they replied. And at the hearing, that's what I discussed. And uh, I, I think they felt a little blindsided by that. One thing that happened at the hearing, which was sort of strange, uh, Intel was there. The you know, general counsel of Intel was at the hearing before the Seventh Circuit. And I remember he was sitting with the attorneys for Data Cash. And when I came in, he introduced himself, and then he wanted to sit with me, and he did. And I know the attorneys for Data Cash were furious about that. Uh, one of the effects of Judge Flom's decision 
before it was affirmed on different grounds by the Seventh Circuit, mm -hmm. was that the Copyright Office changed its practices with respect to registering computer programs, correct? That's true. Uh, no longer could you register the computer programs. It, it was a problem. And uh, everyone wanted to be able to. And that, that's something else that I got into uh, after the Seventh Circuit uh, affirmed Judge Flom on different grounds. Uh, a couple of years later, due to other, with other reasons, I went to the patent, to the copyright office rather, and spoke with them, and we worked out a deal as to how you can copyright software. So, uh, after the Seventh Circuit affirms on different grounds, uh, the computer industry can rest easy. There are also mm -hmm. amendments to the Copyright Act in 1980 that can uh, clear up some of these questions about how to deal with. Uh, software and object right. code. Well, the, the, can I just interrupt you for a second? Because the Seventh Circuit, um, they affirmed on different grounds, and the different grounds were that issue of forfeiture, uh, forfeiture and they agreed that they forfeited their uh, copyright uh, due to uh, not having the proper notice uh, in 1977 mm -hmm. when the item was published first. Um, so they, by doing that, they implied that it's copyrightable to, uh, that software embodied on a ROM is copyrightable because how can you forfeit a copyright if it's not copyrightable? Right, well, and Data Cache's argument in the case was that the failure to include a copyright notice was not fatal to their copyright because the lack of the copyright notice wasn't discovered until 1978. Mm. Uh, that argument does sound a bit of a stretch. Uh, the right. court obviously rejected it. They sure did. No, no one uh, uh, would know how many consumers might or might not have realized there was no copyright notice. But the court, I, I think, uh, was convincing its rejection of that argument. But it does seem that Data Cash's position was a stretch. It was. And the Court of uh -huh. Appeals said, we can't worry about when someone mm -hmm. first noticed it. Mm -hmm. When you published it is what counts, because mm -hmm. we're not going to look into how, you know, who first mm -hmm. noticed it, and in fact, you'd have to take discovery and mm -hmm. go through the world to see who first mm -hmm. noticed it, so that really doesn't work at all. Okay, so uh, Data Cache has forfeited their copyright because the uh, uh, object code is published prior to 1978 without a copyright mm -hmm. notice. The case is remanded. They still have the potential unfair competition argument, mm -hmm. which raised some murky questions, but the case eventually settles, and those are never resolved. Right. They, re they consider them really the misappropriation type argument mm -hmm. where... INS it, versus AP type of misappropriation. Right. If, it, if it's so easy to make a copy, mm -hmm. that's not fair. Mm -hmm. And maybe it should be more difficult. Like it might be okay if you do line by line and mm -hmm. type it in yourself, mm -hmm. but not if you just press out a new ROM. Right. And there were these cases in the 70s and 80s that attempted to make this distinction between types of copying, and if you copy one way, it's all right if there's no copyright, right. but if you copy another way, even though there is no copyright, it could be misappropriation. Right. Uh, so it's possible that uh, that sort of argument could have been an important one back in the Allied Leisure case, but that case didn't develop far enough to uh, result in a decision on that particular question. That's true. Right. Yep. So data cache has come to an end. It's now 1981, and Stern Electronics releases Scramble, which is a huge hit in the arcades. Yes. At this time, even though the major arcade companies are no longer copying in the same way that they were in the early days when Pong is released, you still have these smaller operators out there who are copying the games. Mm -hmm. And in the Stern case, the question is whether or not an audio-visual display of a video game can be protected through copyright. Mm -hmm. The assumption is, is that an audio-visual display for a video game could be created through different computer programs, and you might mm -hmm. not copy the computer program, and yet still end up with the same audio-visual right. display. So now there is a question in the court, can you copyright the audio-visual display of a video game? Right. In fact, uh, at that time, we really... Well, at the beginning, in 1981, for example, we weren't getting copyright registrations on software because of the data cache case. Mm -hmm. So how do you protect the video game? So we thought of uh, protecting it by uh, considering the audiovisual work, the sights and sounds of the video game, to be the copyrightable subject matter. 
So we prepared audiovisual copyright applications. And um, I really didn't file it until we heard about an infringement. Uh, the first infringement, as I recall, was... I didn't you file the registration. File the regi okay. right, for registration. Uh, the first uh, was not Scramble. It was... Uh, Astro Invaders. Astro Invaders, a game by Stern, which also was a fairly successful game. And their first one. Oh, right. well, that's true. Yeah. And uh, we heard that there were uh, infringers. Now, the way the infringement would usually work, video games were much easier to make and put together than, uh, for example, pinball machines. Because once you had the ROMs, so they'd get a circuit board with the ROMs from Japan, and those circuit boards were being shipped, or from Taiwan or Japan, they were being shipped into the United States and picked up by distributors who would then mm -hmm. just give them to these outfits that would put together the upright video games that were copies of Astro Invaders, for example. And it could be done in a garage, because there really weren't that many components needed once you had the circuit board. So we found out about a group. Uh, it was called, well, the main uh, was called uh, Omni Distributing, a Rhode Island company. And they were, one of the infringers, I recall, was uh, Harold Kaufman uh, doing business as Bay Coin in Brooklyn. So we decided to... Uh, get a, registra a copyright registration as quickly as possible on the audiovisual work. And we had it expedited. At that time, to get it expedited, you had to pay extra, plus you had to show that there was an infringement. So we did both. And within a week, we had the registration. And, and how did you handle the registration for an audiovisual work in video game form at that time? Uh, we sent at least one or two copies of the videotape. Okay showing, so the uh, uh, copyright office had the videotape. Of the attract mode. Of, of Right. Of or the at least the attract mode. At least the attract mode. Yeah. And the attract mode is that part of the beginning that recycles. Um, then we immediately, I immediately filed in the, uh, um, in Brooklyn, the United States District Court for the Eastern District of New York, and it was assigned to Judge Nickerson. Uh, we went in for, I think we moved for a temporary restraining order, and uh, the attorneys for Omni and Kaufman, Kaufman was being indemnified by Omni. The attorneys for Omni agreed to a preliminary injunction saying that what they were selling, a game called Zygon, was really, they had no inventory left, it wasn't selling, it was a bad seller, and they didn't care anyway, but they wanted to fight the issue. They, they, they still wanted to keep the case and fight the issue, but they said they'll go along with a preliminary injunction because they don't need to sell it anymore anyway. Um, then we, we learned that Omni was also, or at a slightly later date, was selling Scramble. Same name. And it was the same game as ours. Uh, so we went in for a preliminary injunction against Omni again. And this time they decided to fight it. And we had a preliminary injunction hearing before Judge Nickerson, which was a very interesting hearing. There were a bunch of issues, and I, I hate to get into all the issues, because it might, but it's discussed in my book again. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, the, the long and short of it was, uh, they took the position, Omni, I should say, took the position that uh, the audiovisual is not copyrightable because, well, for one thing, uh, it's not fixed. It's not really a copy, and it's not fixed because it's uh, the action of the player varies what you'd, what you'd see. So the player varies the action. Also, it's not a copy because it really, it's the, they're saying the computer program is what counts, not the audiovisual, and that it's that the ROMs have the computer program on it, and they're fixed but the audiovisual isn't. So as long as you use a different computer program, their position was you should be safe. Yes. Because the visuals are not fixed, fixation is a requirement, and every time it's played, the visuals change. Right. Now, I have a feeling that they had the same computer program as we had, but we didn't really get into mm -hmm. that because we didn't want to. At that time, that was a little complex issue. Mm -hmm. we, wanted to, we really wanted the sights and sounds to be copyrightable because mm -hmm. we knew that was very important 
to the computer industry as well as mm -hmm. to the video game industry. So that's what we wanted. Anyway, we were glad to see uh, uh, Judge Nickerson wrote a beautiful opinion, in my opinion, <laughs> uh, uh, granting the preliminary injunction and going into how, uh, into why the sights and sounds are uh, copyrightable. And we were very happy with that. There was a trademark issue that I won't get into, but it was a very unusual issue, which is covered in the mm -hmm. book, too. So then uh, Omni appealed to the Second Circuit. And during that time, there were a lot of other things that were happening. Uh, we, we started a we started a system of uh, uh, filing lawsuits and impounding what we call the bootleg video games. Mm -hmm. This was to tell the industry that we're serious and we're not going to tolerate bootleg video games. So the first was, uh, uh, it was a scramble, a bootleg scramble being sold on Coney Island mm -hmm. in Brooklyn. And this was perfect because Judge Nickerson had issued the decision already on the uh, um, the other case, and you know, we filed uh, for a motion of, for temporary restraining order against the owner of the, it was called Faber's Arcade on Coney Island. And uh, uh, we got an ex, we went ex party because we knew that if we had uh, gave, given them notice, they'd get rid of it. In fact, whenever we'd go in to impound video games uh, and to seize, have the video games seized, they, we'd always do it ex party. We, we would always go into the judge and say uh, that the uh, defendant would, is li you know, likely or may secrete the device if they knew in advance that we were coming. And I think that's easy to, be, it's easy to see that. So <clears throat> we're able to uh, get these ex party orders. And uh, uh, once I'd get the order, I'd get... Uh, we'd go to the marshal's office, the marshal, set that up with a marshal to come out to, for example, the Coney Island. Uh, we would uh, get a trucker to go with us. And I remember that was the first one we did in Coney Island. I remember we went there with the trucker, with the marshal, myself, and I brought a camera. So while this was all happening, I was taking pictures so we could, and then I wrote a publicity release also. So I was, um, the PR agent as well as the attorney. So we put it together to give Stern some publicity as to how we were handling this, to let the industry know that we were serious. Now, the Coney Island seizure went fine, but yeah. you do tell the story about another oh. one that didn't go so well, and that was near Madison and 110th Street yes. in New York. I've right. never been there, but apparently it was a rough area. It, it, it's a rough area of Harlem, back at that oh. time particularly. And uh, so first, we had, we had two uh, cases there. They, in fact, I, brought, I remember we brought them in the Southern District of New York and Judge Sweet, and I think he's still sitting, um, was handling that. Uh, he gave us the restraining orders, the impounding orders, and again, we got the marshals. And first, I remember picking up a bunch of machines right by Rodney Dangerfield's. Uh, the, a place on a comedy club, uh, the, the kind right by the comedy club. I think it was next door to his comedy club. I think his comedy club is still there, somewhere on the Upper East Side, around 60th and First mm -hmm. or something like that. Then we went with the um, well, we went with the marshals, and the, uh, we were in a cab. There were truckers, and the marshal. And I remember the marshal and I were in a cab. We went up to that 110th Street and Madison Avenue location, and. It really looked like a bombed out area. I mean, everything, graffiti, plus the, uh, the buildings looked like they were in bad shape. And it looked a little strange, but we walked mm -hmm. in, and it was a convenience store. Uh, there was a woman behind the counter, and the marshal showed her the order, and we started. They, were, they had about, I think, five, six, maybe more video, mm -hmm. of the video games, all the bootlegs. And the, mar and the uh, truckers started taking them out. And the next thing we knew, Eight men came in, and I guess they were somehow connected with the convenience store, and they locked the marshal and me in well, the they, they brought Dobermans, didn't they? Right. They came with two Doberman pinchers, and they locked the marshal and me inside the convenience store. And one of them said, and oh, these dogs were really dying to get at us. I mean, they were jumping at us, and, but they were held by, by leashes. 
And one of the guys said, um, if you don't get out of the machines back right away, we're going to let these dogs go. So I remember the marshal who had a gun with him inside his jacket said to me, what do you think we should do? And I said, I think we should give them the machines back. <laughs> and the marshal said, that's a good idea. So we gave them the machines back. And I remember as we left, there were some kids up on the roof throwing stones at us. Mm -hmm. it, you were it taking away their video games. I know. It, it was a bad <laughs> scene. And uh, when, I, when I left and we were driving back with the marshal, he said, well, you know, we're going to take some action. We want you to press charges. I said, you know, forget it. I said, they, they probably didn't even know they were bootleg video games. Mm -hmm. We're not going back there. I'm not going back mm -hmm. there. I'm not going <laughs> to press charges. I'm glad to be out here. So after that incident, the Second Circuit eventually hands down its decision and affirms the district court and holds that the audiovisual display of Scramble is copyrightable. But before we talk about what happened in the written decision, I'd like to back up just a moment and talk about the oral argument. Sure. Uh, Judge John Newman was on the case. He was mm -hmm. on the panel. And he's long been known as one of the more influential judges in the area of copyright. Did you see it as a plus? or a minus to get a, an expert in the area on the panel? You know, I really didn't think of it then. First, I didn't know he was going to be a judge until I got there. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess it cuts both ways. Being an expert mm -hmm. on copyright law could either hurt me or help me, so I couldn't mm -hmm. tell whether that was good or bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the judges were, though, very interested in the argument. You said that they allowed uh, both sides to go away over time in answering their questions. Right, they really were. Um, in fact, we were each given 15 minutes, but when Omni gave its argument, the attorney was given 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. They were so interested. And then when I started talking, they said, you know, you can also have the 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to hear, we have a lot of questions, and mm -hmm. we want to hear what you have to say. And I, one thing they were fascinated with, I brought a couple of ROMs with me, and I just handed them to the clerk who handed them to the judges, and I was telling them, the program is all right in this. Mm -hmm. And he, they were looking at that. They were fascinated. Nowadays, when you see an integrated circuit chip or proms, mm -hmm. you don't or a microprocessor, you don't think much mm -hmm. of it. But at that time, uh, if you're not, if you weren't really technical, mm -hmm. it was fascinating to see uh, how this was, how you could embed software into uh, a little thing that you hold in your hand like that. Now, when you got the decision from the Second Circuit in 1982, mm -hmm. it was a huge win for the video game industry. It was. What, what did the court say? Well, the court said that uh, very clearly that the audio on the audiovisual display of a video game mm -hmm. is copyrightable, and that was the main. Mm -hmm. uh, and how did they resolve the fixation question that at least initially mm -hmm. seemed like some sort of hurdle for yeah. copyright protection? Well, the, they said that uh, even uh, sure it's fixed in a, in some kind of a medium mm -hmm. and it's fixed in the ROM, so that's fixed. And he said, as, as far as it being a copy and uh, mm -hmm. uh, the track mode, for example, repeats mm -hmm. over and over, and any differences in the, even the, the game itself are minor mm -hmm. compared to the game. Well, I remember when I would argue it, I would always say, this is no different than a play on Broadway. Things are always changed a little, mm -hmm. and it still is a copy. It still is doing the same play. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what it really looked like to me and to them, I'm sure. And much of the game is indeed fixed. The, oh, yeah. the uh, landscape in the game yeah. is going to have a consistent look to it. The ships that the player flies have a consistent look. So it's, it's really a large portion of the game is, in fact, Absolutely. Fixed. It's really just some movements and coincidences mm -hmm. that, are, mm -hmm. that are changed by the player. But mm -hmm. uh, when you play it, I mean, anyone looking at it can see it's the same game. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, Stern wasn't your last case in the video game industry, uh, but I take it that your practice did move in other directions in the mid to late 80s? Pretty much. Um, I'd say it became more patent-oriented than ever. I had another case in the uh, copyright area relating to Section 117, the archival copy issue, mm -hmm. which became an, an interesting case, but from there... Uh, I've done a lot of expert witnessing in mm -hmm. patent cases. Uh, I've uh, really been doing a lot of work on patent infringement lawsuits, and I, I, I guess I would say I concentrated more on that, although I still mm -hmm. had a lot of trademark work and some copyright mm -hmm. work also. So looking back at many years of significant work in the video game industry, what was the highlight? Well, 
you know, I really feel the highlight is arguing cases before the Court of Appeals. I love jury trials, too, but the jury trials were patent cases, but waiting for a jury decision is great. Mm -hmm. Getting a favorable jury decision uh -huh. is the greatest. But also, uh, I love arguing cases in the Court of Appeals. In fact, in the Stern case, uh, in the Second Circuit, uh, I'm from New York originally, mm -hmm. and my mother mm -hmm. lived in Forest Hills in Queens. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the only case she ever went to to see me in court. Mm -hmm. So she went to that argument in the Second Circuit. And I remember afterwards, she said, I was so nervous. I was so nervous. I said, gee, I wasn't. I loved every bit of it. <laughs> well, thanks again, George, uh, for taking I the time you. to speak with me. The book is called Clear and Convincing Evidence, 50 Years of Intellectual Property War Stories. Thanks. Despite what Tetra says about protecting movement, if it looked very different visually, uh, the court might say, well, this is not infringing. You've right. changed the look of it enough. Or, or even having some mm. mechanic mm. change, mm. even if it incorporates much of what was in Tetris. I think if they're willing to make some rule change so that it's no longer just Tetris, the exact uh, game rules. Then, then they will probably survive uh, infringement. Right. Well, we're out of time. Ben, I want to thank you very much for joining me and uh, uh, having this discussion about patents and a little bit about copyright as well. Thank sure. you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.